Hello and welcome. Thanks for attending today's webinar, Getting It Done, Stories in a CICD Environment. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few items regarding this webinar platform. At the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a handful of widgets, mainly Q&A, which you can utilize to submit any questions you have throughout today's session. For viewing purposes, you can also expand your viewing window by clicking on the icon found on the top right corner of your slide viewer. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. And lastly, take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. At this time, I'll turn it over to your presenters, Bradley and Jacob. Thanks. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, today, we'll be talking about getting it done, uh, stories in the CICD environment. Uh, we'll be focusing a lot on merging agile practices uh, with uh, your CICD tools in order to frame up your work effectively to get the most value for your customers. To kick us off, we'll actually do a couple introductions of ourselves. Um, so with that, Jacob. Hello, I'm Jacob McCanty. Uh, I am a software developer uh, with uh, Insight. I've been here for about three years now um, with a focus on uh, .NET Core uh, and uh, MVC web apps. And hi, everybody. I'm Bradley Pohl. Um, I'm a Scrum Master with Insight. I'm relatively new at Insight, um, but prior to that, I worked a variety of IT roles at Fifth Third Bank, which I see at least one, Carrie. Hi, Carrie, uh, from Fifth Third uh, in the audience today, um, as well as trying my hand as an entrepreneur in the digital advertising space for small businesses. Um, one note, uh, while we're going through uh, the presentation, feel free to put uh, questions, uh, enter your questions. Um, if they're pertinent to this slide, uh, we'll try to address those immediately. Otherwise, we've got some time set aside at the end uh, to handle those questions, but those will be much appreciated. So here's a picture of our agenda today. Um, so as we said, we are going to be talking about merging agile practices with CICD to get the most value out of your work for your customers. So to kick us off, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Agile practices, kind of get us all speaking the same language, um, what we refer to as Agile, what do we mean when we say that. Uh, then going over to CICD, doing the same thing, and then we'll get into the, to the meat of the presentation, which is around how do we refine our work uh, to get the most value out of it. We'll end with a real world scenario and a quick wrap up to talk about some key highlights. So with that, to get the juices flowing a little bit, we're asking the question, is your team currently utilizing some form of Agile practice? And you should see something pop up on your screen here. It's what's called a pulse check. And we want to see kind of what our audience today is uh, if they're using or consider themselves using Agile practices. That can mean Scrum, that can mean Kanban, Kanban, depending on your, your uh, pronunciation of it, all different types of things. Okay, so far we got, all right, six and two. Nice. All right, so we've got We've got seven and two, so the majority of you consider yourselves to be using some sort of agile practice. That's great. So we'll move on here. Uh, so what do we mean when we say agile? Well, there's a lot of different origin stories to it, but most people can point back to uh, the creation of what's called the Agile Manifesto. So back in 2000, there was this group of 17 developers uh, they put themselves up in a ski lodge for three days and tried to answer the question, how can we deliver software quicker to our customers and have less planning overhead? And in those three days, they came up with what's called the Agile Manifesto, which consists of uh, four values and 12 principles. So these four values that you see on the screen are probably familiar to a lot of you. Um, they include individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Now, it's not to say the ones on the bottom aren't valuable. It just means we want to value the ones on the top more. And if you follow those values, they can actually be transferred into these principles here and addressed with them. So here's, here's just four examples of some of the principles that you can find in uh, the Agile Manifesto. 
Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. Working software is, is the primary measure of progress and simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. So what were they dancing around with these values and principles? They were onto something. They were suggesting that traditional manufacturing work, traditioning product work or project work wasn't scratching the itch for software development. There was something inherently different about software development that needed its own unique approach. And we're gonna dig into why that might be. So up on the screen, we've got what is commonly called the Stacy complexity diagram. So on the y-axis, we have, uh, it, we have uh, the what, what of what we're trying to build. And then on the uh, x-axis, we have the how we're trying to build it. So the further you move away from the middle, the more uncertain, the more unknowns uh, there are uh, regarding what we're trying to do and how we're trying to build it. So closest to the middle is the simple area. And in this simple area, there's really not a lot of unknowns. Most things are known here, the vast majority of them. You can think of things that are mostly repeatable, okay? So manufacturing processes, maybe building a house or making a sandwich, right? We know the ingredients, we can plan out ahead of time exactly the steps that need to happen and we only need to mitigate for the things that could go wrong. This is where your traditional project management would land with a long planning stage and then a, an execution uh, stage that follows that. When we move out a little bit more, we get into this complicated zone. There, there's more known there is, than there is unknown, but there's still some unknowns. Uh, you, can, you can think of planning a vacation. Okay, so you've been, if you've been on a vacation before, you understand that you need some place to stay, you need some way to get there. There are some knowns there, but there are also variabilities depending on where you're going. So it's not this exactly the same every single time, but you know generally the framework in which you need to approach it. Then there's complexity. So complexity is where there are more unknowns than there are knowns. And really a perfect example of this would be a lot of software development. So let's say we wanna create a new feature where customers are able to see their uh, banking balance, right? They're, we don't know exactly how to do that, right? What tools are we gonna use? How are we gonna develop that? And we don't know exactly what would be the best way to show that to our customers. And so the, the work itself is not necessarily repeatable. Each thing might be significantly different from the other. And then there's chaos. In chaos, we have no idea what the heck's going on, right? And the best course of action there would just to be do something. So how do we navigate this uncertainty? How do we navigate complexity? And how does Agile help us do that? Well, there's this thing called empiricism. Now, empiricism, as described by the Scrum Guide, asserts the knowledge that comes from experience and making decisions based on what is observed. In plain English, that means we want to learn from what is known or what has happened in the past. And then we want to make decisions based on what we know from our experience. So how does this work? So how, how do we use empiricism to navigate complexity? Well, there's these three pillars. There's transparency, inspection, and adaptation. And when they move in a cycle like this, we call it the inspection and adaptation loop. So what transparency means is transparency means we're all speaking the same language. We all agree on what reality is. This is really key. We'll, we'll hit on this several different times. It's all about creating shared understanding of of the reality of the product, this current state of the product. Inspection is looking at that reality of the product or that current state and saying, are we okay with it? Are there any changes that we should make? Do we want more people to visit our website? Are people having troubles in this certain area? We're inspecting it. And then the adaptation part is effectively an experiment. So how are we going to affect, how are we gonna use that inspection to come up with an experiment to try to change that reality, try to change the product for the better. And then we do the loop again. We can also think of this as effectively the scientific method, right? We're creating a hypothesis, we're gonna test it, we're gonna see the results and see if we're happy with it. 
And if not, we're going to take that knowledge and we're going to apply it to come up with better exper experiments. So what really using empiricism to navigate that complexity becomes is, is a cycle of inspection and adaptation to try to gain as much knowledge as possible so that we can make better decisions from it. All right, it's a lot of information here. So what do experiments look like in an agile environment? So Scrum lays out that they're called product backlog items. They have many names, but effectively product backlog items are experiments. They are the work that is to be integrated into the product. You can think of them as product backlog items, short for PBIs, or PBIs is short for product backlog items. Tickets, cards, bugs, stories, all those different names could be considered product backlog items. They are essentially work that is to be integrated into the product. They're, they're the experiments and that adaptation, that the adaptation part that you are trying to run to see if you can change uh, the, the state of your product for the better. Now they'll consist of tons of deep, uh, not tons of details, sorry, a number of different things, uh, description, order, as far as priority and size. So how big are the product back? We'll, we'll dig into these uh, a little deeper, but essentially we'll be using product backlog items to represent our work, uh, interchangeable with uh, the other names there as well. So with that, I'll pass it off to Jacob to give us a little background on CICD. Thank you, Bradley. So before I get too far into CICD, um, I'm just going to send another pulse check here. Uh, just to ask, is your team currently practicing some form of CICD? Now, this ties into our earlier question. A lot of times when uh, we're practicing Agile, um, it, uh, it also helps to uh, it, it enables you to practice some form of CICD. So if you are, great. If not, uh, hopefully this, uh, this presentation will help you uh, move in that direction. We've got almost half of the responses so far. And looks like we're kind of hovering around 50%. Looks like most people are trying to practice some form of CICD on their uh, project, which is great. Uh, hopefully what we're about to discuss will uh, uh, help you uh, practice even more CICD practices. Or if you're not uh, quite there yet, hopefully this will give you some ideas on where you can get started. So what do we mean by CICD? Well, CICD, when we're talking about it, means continuous integration and continuous delivery. So continuous integration, we're talking changes are uh, integrated into the code base. You've got your PRs all submitted. You've got um, your, uh, your changes integrated and they're tested, but they're not out to the uh, client yet or the end user yet. When we're doing continuous delivery, we're sending the changes uh, as soon as they're available to the end user, right? So this is the next step where you've got all your changes. Now you're pushing them to the end user to get that feedback loop. Um, and uh, what we're trying to achieve here with uh, a CIC process is we're trying to minimize the amount of manual checks um, uh, that uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to minimize the amount of manual uh, checks that uh, inhibit this process or slow it down. Um, so when we're going out uh, to the end, us uh, end users, this is kind of what your delivery pipeline looks like here. You're, you're going to be building your application, then you're going to be testing it, then you're going to be releasing it to the, your users. The feedback loop starts when your users get the, uh, uh, get the update, and you can monitor their feedback and then use that feedback to plan your next build. It's really powerful because it gives you uh, ways to uh, further enhance your product, uh, product beyond what was already planned or make changes to that plan to support your users' needs. Now, when we're talking CACD, there's a lot of tools, and some of you might recognize this, uh, uh, this symbol. For uh, uh, it, It's kind of like a DevOps symbol. DevOps and CICD tend to play really nicely with each other. Um, and we have this graphic here just to kind of uh, show there are so many different tools that you can be using to achieve your CICD processes. 
You can use tools like Azure DevOps, GitLab, uh, GitHub, um, Jenkins, all to help you in some way manage different aspects of your CI CD, whether that be your stories, your actual pipeline, um, your uh, deployments, and your builds. Um, so but the important thing here, though, is not to get lost in the tools, right? These tools just help enable you um, uh, to get to the uh, to get to your uh, desired end state, but um, it doesn't. Uh, what we're talking about today can really be done agnostic of these tools. So, the point of this presentation is to uh, discover how can we use Power CID, CICD to create value for our users, or rather, support inspection and adaptation. So Bradley already talked about this, but we're going to be focusing in really heavily on the inspection and adaptation portions of the feedback. Uh, so how can we make things better going forward? So with that said, why are we practicing CI-CD? Well, CI-CD enables us to release faster in general. Um, we're trying to get our updates out to the user so we can get that feedback loop started, right? We also reduce the cost to integrate and deploy. Because we're starting to move faster, um, your, uh, your stories by necessity are smaller and they integrate much more quickly with your, uh, with your actual like trunk application or, um, the, uh, or, or your, uh, uh, and get out to your end users faster. There's ways that we can facilitate uh, CI/CD with automated testing, and when we do building out CI/CD testing, that also in, uh, increases your use of automated testing. So unit testing, regression testing, integration testing, a lot of those different uh, testing techniques can be automated in your pipelines, which helps you build out more resilient uh, and uh, scalable, uh, scalable updates. You also have improved confidence when you do, do a deployment with automated testing. You can also automate your infrastructure with CI CD. So if you are trying to stand up a server or something in a new region, if you've automated that process within your CI CD pipelines, that process instantly becomes so much simpler. Uh, than having to remember how, what manual processes you did to stand it up in the first region. Uh, yeah, another reason why we do CI/CD is we reduce manual mistakes. So we already talked a little bit about this, but we're trying to remove all of the manual, uh, as many of the manual checks rather, as we can from our processes. Um, so if you have any places where you have someone trying to do a manual check or a manual process before you get out to production, well, that's just an, uh, a region where you're introducing uh, a human error. And not to say that we're not all good at our jobs or anything, but I, I've definitely been on projects where it's been very easy to make a very, uh, a very small error or click the wrong button and do something by mistake. So when you're, autom uh, when you're doing CICD, you're trying to automate, you're reducing those manual mistakes. And therefore, you're also ensuring repeatability and resiliency and scalability in your applications. So the more you can automate, the more repeatable your processes are, and the more resilient and confident you will be in your uh, ability to re release your applications. And there's a number of different CI/CD practices you can uh, practice to get you there. So you can practice test-driven development or behavior-driven development. Uh, you can practice, uh, uh, you, you can automate, uh, aut as we've already talked about, you can automate your uh, repetitive manual tasks. Um, you can use infrastructure as code. So a lot of people nowadays are starting to use Terraform and other tools like that to build out their infrastructure or their servers. Uh, you can also start uh, valuing and utilizing smaller units of work. So I kind of already touched on this a little bit too, but when you're practicing CI/CD, and we're going to uh, be digging into this a little bit more in the crux of our presentation with our uh, 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 units of work discussion, but um, you're really valuing smaller units of work because you can get those done much more quickly. They're much easier to integrate, and if there's a problem, it's much easier to do root cause analysis because you know exactly what 
what you've been working on. It's fresh in your mind. It, uh, and because the work uh, unit is much smaller, it's much easier to identify what is causing the actual issue. You can also use tagging um, and blue-green deployments to help facilitate CICD as well. So when you're using a good tagging strategy, if you push an out, update out to your users and something goes wrong, if you have a really good tagging strategy in place, it's really easy to figure out what the last version of your application was that they had that was live. You can do a quick rollback and make sure that they get back to a working version of the software. Now, if you're doing blue-green deployments as well, this is even easier because what you do is you just swap out which environment is live. So you basically have two live environments or two production environments, rather. And uh, you do a deployment out to the one that's not live, and then you do a cutover, making the uh, one you just deployed to live. So you still have your old version uh, in production, and you can swap back to it if need be. But um, this allows you to do a safe deployment out to your users and make sure that everything looks good, be uh, good before you uh, need to do any kind of uh, additional work. I think I accidentally skipped a slide there. So I'm, with that said, I'm going to pass it off back off to uh, Bradley here uh, to talk about refining CICD work. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. So we've learned some background around agile practices. We learned uh, what we mean when we say CICD, some of the practices that uh, can be used with CICD. Now what we're going to talk about is how to refine your work to be used effectively um, in, in the CI/CD environment to get the most out of it, to really maximize those inspection and adaptation loops. So refining CI/CD work, one of the major things, and if you can take you know, just a couple, a handful of things away from this presentation, one of the big things is valuing smaller units of work. So why do we wanna do that? If we use smaller PBIs, we will reduce the, reduce the risk by when effectively when we're doing larger units of work, we're betting, you know, let's say a month's worth of work on an experiment when we're doing a larger unit of work. When we're doing a smaller unit of work, we are betting only, let's say, two days, three days, maybe even one day of work. And so, therefore, your risk level goes down. You're also introducing smaller scope changes as well, which also reduces the risk. All right, has everybody seen the slide here? Sorry. We're refining CSD. Okay, cool. We were having a little issues on our side. Um, so reducing the risk and shortening the feedback loop. So we talked about reducing the risk, now shortening the feedback loop. Because we're getting the smaller units of work out faster, we're also able to make those inspection and adaptation loops a lot smaller because we are getting in the hands of the customer much quicker. And therefore, we can adjust faster. If you remember back to the Stacy complexity model that we were talking about earlier, if we can gain smaller units of knowledge quicker, we are able to navigate that uncertainty much more effectively. So here's some helpful components, and we'll dig into some of these. The description, a desired outcome to your work, acceptance criteria, and size. And then finally, when we're refining CICD work, keep the end in mind. And part of that is the definition of done, which we'll go into a little bit later, but effectively the definition of done is what's the minimum work that needs to be done to be considered, uh, to, to consider the work of quality and being okay to be released to our users. So let's jump into a description. What makes a good description in a CIC environment? It's concise and informative. When we were thinking back to those three pillars, transparency, inspection, and adaptation, this is really about that transparency pillar. If we're concise and informative, everybody is starting to gain a shared understanding of what the reality of the product is, what the reality of the experiment is. We're all talking the same language, right? I'm sure you guys have all been in meetings where people are kind of talking past each other because they are, they're thinking they're on the same page, but they're really not. And by keeping your descriptions concise and informative, you're giving yourself a better chance that we can better utilize the group to make better decisions. So the uh, description tells effectively the scope of 
the story or a product backlog item. And part of that is the desired outcome. And you can, you can think of this as in a user story example, as a user, I want some goals so that I achieve some benefit, right? Now, we like to use user stories, um, and that's, that's just one of the ways that product backlog items or one of the forms that product backlog items can be found because it keeps the users in mind as well as builds in that outcome that we're looking for versus just, let's just do something. Well, why are we doing it? It builds in that outcome um, from the description. And then finally, one thing that uh, we run the risk of when we're writing stories that uh, we tend to add a lot more scope in there than we want. Remember, these are small experiments. We wanna keep them small. So if you find yourself in descriptions saying the word and a lot, that might be a trigger for you to think, can we divide this work into something smaller? What is this, sm and, and ask the question, what is the smallest amount of work that we have to do to achieve value? What is the smallest increment that we have to do to achieve value? Let's try to get it down to there because we know that if we have smaller units of work, we reduce the risk and we can get it out to the customers quicker to test our hypothesis. And acceptance criteria. So acceptance criteria can be thought of as guardrails for the developers. What does that mean? Well, we're really, we're, we're layering on essentially some of the requirements to, uh, to a product backlog item that is necessary to be completed to, to consider it done. So this is layered on top of the definition of done. These are things that include technical requirements, uh, anything that makes it unique uh, from a testing perspective that we need to consider when completing the story and even automation criteria. So automation criteria can be thought of as when we're doing the story, is there anything that we need to automate or build into the pipeline before we consider this done? And we're going to go into that uh, piece a little bit more in more detail later because it's pretty important to the CICD uh, pipeline. All right, definition of done. Definition of done is a formal description of the state of the increment when it meets the quality measures required for the product. In simple terms, what is the minimum, uh, what is the minimum requirement of quality for your stories? To be considered releasable, what needs to happen to be considered releasable? Now, this is a really good tool for, uh, for refining your work because it creates that transparency around not only what needs to be done, but also transparency around what a releasable product is to your business as well. So people understand if, if you make your definition of done uh, visible, then people understand what quality means for your product. And that first one is treated as a living document. So at a minimum, it needs to adhere to organizational standards for things like testing and all the other aspects that we have there. But after that, you should, your team should be layering on things on top of that definition of done and experimenting, right? Inspection and adaption is not only for the product, but also our process of what is, what is effective and what isn't um, for our definition of done. So in a definition of done, you can consider uh, testing criteria, I mean, we could have had, there's a litany of different testing. We're actually thinking about doing a word cloud here with the amount of different testing that I'm sure you all have seen. Um, but for, for simplicity's sake, regression unit integration. Uh, automation criteria, minimum deployment environment. So what environment, what, in, what is the highest environment that a build needs to be successful in before it's considered releasable? Versioning strategy, how are we naming our builds to create transparency across the team around <laughs> what version of the product is going out to the customer, uh, what versions are in the pipeline, and as well as simplifying um, simplifying the, the language so if we need to roll something back, we know which one to roll back to. That, that's very important. Code coverage, uh, that goes along the lines of testing criteria, uh, our unit tests covering essentially a lot of our functions in our product um, that could have an asterisk next to it because we do know that it can be gamified, but it still can be a useful tool. And then peer review. So is there code review? 
Um, we hope there's code review with others on your team. Some teams also like to institute a product owner, uh, product owner approval or manager approval. We tend to be a little bit more hesitant about that because it could introduce uh, slowness into your process unnecessarily. And then finally, when, when you've crafted your definition of done, take a look and see if there's anything that you can actually build into the CI CD itself. And that goes along the lines of automation, right? So with all these aspects, if we do all these things, you can start to see, you know, where traditional project management is coming from, right? To release something, it takes three months to, to go through all these different risk processes and testing and all this different, all these different things. Well, use CI CD as a tool there and take a look of what is worth investing in to automate. Because what that will enable you to do, right, is once again, smaller, smaller scope of work delivered to the customer quicker. And so if we can build those into automated, if they're repeatable, let's do that. All right, Jacob, you wanna take right. this question? Absolutely. Uh, this is one of the fa my favorite questions I get all the time when we're, whenever I'm on a team that's doing test-driven development is how much testing is too much? And this plays really nicely into our story uh, or PBI rather talk as well, because when we're ta uh, you, you might have already noticed we're talking a lot about, okay, what can we automate? What can we aut uh, automatically test in our pipelines? And a lot of times that criteria comes in our stories. And the question gets asked all the time, well, how much testing is too much? Well, for me, the answer is always whenever you have overlapping or redundant test cases. Uh, essentially, whenever you're writing a test case, you always wanna be testing uh, something new. Let's say you're, uh, you uh, have a form that you're filling out and you need to uh, limit the, uh, uh, the options that a user can submit to numerical values between one and 100. Um, so a, uh, a good test would be um, testing negative one, testing zero maybe, just uh, test those edge cases um, uh, and maybe testing something kind of in the middle and testing some letters, right? But after that, you start getting into redundant test cases. It doesn't help you um, to test, say, entering 55 and then entering 56. You're not gaining anything new from testing that you can enter 55 and 56. You already know if okay, 55 works, you can make an educated guess and say 56 is probably gonna work as well. So when you're writing test cases uh, and making test case suggestions in your uh, acceptance criteria, um, you really want to prioritize uh, the quality of the test case versus the quantity. Make sure you're testing something new, something that's uh, crucial uh, when, when you're doing your test case versus Okay, but, but we don't want to just have a mountain of test cases testing the exact same condition. And we also talked uh, pretty, uh, a, a little bit about automation criteria, right? So, what need, uh, so as Bradley already mentioned, what needs to be automated for the story to be done? Um, <clears throat> so, we, uh, we can, uh, this could be stuff that you're doing in your deployment pipeline, uh, your automated uni uh, unit or integration tests, or even just your infrastructure. So maybe your automation criteria could include like you need to have updated Terraform modules for the uh, SQL databases you're creating, or you need to have um, all of your unit tests passing with 100% uh, code coverage, or something like that in order for your deployment pipeline uh, to advance. Um, let's see. We also uh, are investing in automation upfront, which can slow, uh, which, which can and will slow technical de debt creation. So for example, um, going, if we go back to that uh, SQL Server example uh, I just mentioned, Maybe initially it, uh, it doesn't seem like it's worthwhile for you to create a Terraform module to handle the SQL, uh, the SQL server creation. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's just like you're, you're only deploying in one environment. It's kind of a pain to uh, make the Terraform, so I'll just do it manually this time. Well, that's great if you're doing it just the one time and you'll never ever have to do it again. But let's say down the road you need to deploy your application to a new environment. 
what are you going to do then? Well, you can try to remember what you did for the SQL Server creation maybe a year or two uh, ago. So you can try to uh, stand it up the same way. Or if you already have your Terraform that you created back, way back in the day, you can leverage that to go ahead and stand up your SQL Server the exact same way with the exact same tables that you already had. Uh, and that, that just helps uh, cut down on the amount of technical debt down the road, right? You, uh, you, you can just let your automation handle the processes, so it's a way easier to do things uh, in the future. As we've already touched on, this ensures repeatability, so you know exactly how everything's going to behave when you're uh, deploying each time. And it ensures uniformity, so you know, yes, it's, uh, it's repeatable, it's going to happen the exact same way every time. So let's take a look at what this means in the real uh, real world, right? So I've been on uh, several teams where exactly what we're talking about in this presentation um, uh, has happened to us. So we were on a, a, a team where we were doing, uh, we, we essentially had a split focus. We, had, we were doing a lot of infrastructure work. So we were doing a lot of resource creation in Azure, um, and we were also doing uh, a lot of web development and standing up uh, uh, service applications that needed to be deployed out to those environments. And what we were seeing was the work wasn't getting done. We had knowledge silos. We had about two or three people that really knew Azure, knew Azure well, and we had about two or three people that knew web apps and knew web apps really well, and there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge uh, overlap there. So whenever we had a, uh, and we were also using Scrum at this point, uh, so whenever we had a sprint where it was going to be very infrastructure heavy, where we were creating um, a lot of Azure resources like uh, load balancers or uh, co uh, Cosmos d databases, um, we were seeing that it was really only h half the team was able to work on these, uh, uh, these stories um, at, at a time. And vice versa, if we had a... Uh, uh, a sprint that was very application heavy, that other half of the team was uh, uh, really busy, but not the other half, they, they couldn't really pick it up. So we had those knowledge silos and it was really slowing us down, preventing us from getting our work done. So what we did uh, was we, uh, we, in one of our uh, sprint uh, refinements uh, or retrospectives, we, re we identified this need of, okay, only half the team is really working at a time. What can we do to help the other team? And we focused in on our stories uh, specifically because we wanted to ensure that regardless of whatever sprint work was being planned, anyone on the team would feel comfortable picking up a story or a PBI and working on it. And the way we did that was we added additional details to our story, story descriptions and acceptance criteria. So we were very much, very more, uh, much more explicit in what we were doing um, in each story and what the act, uh, expected outcome was. So maybe uh, we, ha we had some acceptance, uh, the acceptance criteria was more specific on do this, do not do that uh, kind, of, kind of language. We also ensured the sizing was agreed upon by the entire group. So that was really important for us as well because whenever we were uh, sizing our stories, some people were pointing uh, or, or sizing it rather as really, really small, like a, uh, a size small story or uh, uh, maybe a medium story. Other people were sizing it as like an extra large because they didn't know what kind of work was going into it and it was intimidating to them. And what that led to was some really good conversations of, okay, what details do you need in order for you to feel comfortable picking up this story and maybe uh, uh, getting your size down closer to where we are, or maybe we need to move it up. And we had those really good conversations that added the detail uh, that we needed for, uh, for good starting points on our stories. We also revisited our definition of done to align more with our DevOps and CICD practices. So we were very uh, much trying to push the automation as much as we could um, here so that we, once we did something, we only had to do it once and we never had to do it again. Uh, we also broke down our larger stories. So let's say we had a story that regardless of how we looked at it and talked about it, we couldn't get it out of like an extra, uh, being like an extra large. 
what we did then was we found the ants, like uh, like Bradley already talked about. We found where we had ants, and we were able to separate those uh, into smaller stories that were much more tackable, tackleable, and uh, could be completed within the sprint. Now, what this looked like. So here's a little um, image, uh, or not image, but a uh, sample story that we were uh, that was actually in our backlog at one point for this project, um, where we. Uh, it was uh, we were doing a pricing application, and the uh, ask was, as a store manager, I want to upload pricing data to the database via an API call, which sounds pretty simple. You know, you, you understand what needs to uh, get done there, and we had the acceptance criteria of user can upload pricing data via API into the database, so that sounds great as well. But there's not a whole lot of meat and potatoes here. You don't really understand, okay, well, what am I actually supposed to do? I can create an API, but how am I getting the information uh, or how is the user going to be submitting the information to me? How does the information need to look on the back end? Uh, that sort of information. So after our processes, uh, our, after our story update, basically taking into account the uh, uh, everyone's input and trying to make sure we were all on the same page. This is what our description looked like. As a store manager, I want to upload pricing data uh, spreadsheets to the database via an API call. So we knew ex we were explicitly working with Excel spreadsheets or CSV spreadsheets. Uh, specifically because of this next sentence here, I want to be able to upload all the pricing data for items via CSV uh, spreadsheets. We also had some more explicit uh, acceptance criteria. So a user can upload CSV spreadsheets via an API endpoint to the database. We had a very technical limitation that we discovered here where file size must not exceed one gigabyte. That was just the amount of data that our application at that point was capable of processing. So anything over that had to be rejected. We also needed to explicitly reject other file types because there was a uh, the, the uh, corporation we were working with was, at that point was trying to standardize their processes. Some people were trying, uh, still trying to use uh, uh, specifically Excel spreadsheets. Some people were trying to use uh, uh, PDFs or Word documents to keep track of their, uh, their sheets. And we, the business very explicitly said, no, we need to be keeping track of these via CSVs so that we can standardize what they, uh, the look and feel of them and make sure that there's no uh, no issues with the, uh, uh, the data coming in. And you can see this is uh, the, on the right side here, it's a much more explicit story. You have a very much more clear idea of, okay, this is where I need to go. This is uh, the type of work that needs to be done. There's not a whole lot of ambiguity here um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. And we started seeing benefits right away as soon as we t uh, started doing this. So if we look at it by the numbers, we spent uh, uh, basically double the time in our refinement. So we had a, uh, a refinement where we were looking at our stories, at our PBI items, and uh, that time went from, uh, the time we spent doing that went from one hour to two hours. But by spending that extra hour, we basically doubled our sprint capacity. So we're using points here but it really translates to sizing as well. Essentially, we were able to double the amount of stories that we were uh, completing each sprint, which was incredible because we, like I said we ha earlier, we had those knowledge silos where about half the team was doing work at any given time and the other half couldn't really do the same work. But by adding those explicit details, uh, anyone in our, uh, in our team was able to, able to feel confident having a starting point uh, on the stories and being able to pick them up and get them done um, we also uh, were able to up our release cadence uh, because we were getting so much more work done so much more quickly. We went from releasing roughly once a month to once every two weeks. And once we got even better at breaking down these stories, we actually took it down to once a week. We were pushing out these updates, and it was incredible um, just how much faster we were able to move. So as I already touched on, our outcomes were anyone was able to pick up story and immediately know where to start. We completed more work, and what's also important uh, as a call-out, we didn't have to change any of the tools we were using. We, did, we were using Azure DevOps to track our stories. We were using uh, Azure DevOps pipelines to uh, manage our deployments. We were using Terraform to manage our infrastructure creation. 
we didn't have to change anything about that. We just started leveraging the tools to their fullest extent. And by doing that, we were able to uh, ach uh, achieve these outcomes, which was absolutely incredible for us and allowed us to get so much more work done. So with that said, uh, I'm going to pass it back off to Bradley for a quick wrap up. So Brad. And yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jacob. That was awesome. Uh, so to wrap it up, um, we've talked about uh, our agile practices. We've talked about CICD. Um, so we've talked about how agile brings the framework and the mindset and CICD brings those tools that will really, when they're working together, really enables them to, we call it turbocharging those inspection and adaptation loops. Um, and it actually works both ways, right? So uh, CICD turbocharges the agile inspection ad adaptation loops, but it also works the other way where we actually can improve our tooling when we're taking a look at inspecting it and adapting uh, our tooling and process. So we're going to have a couple of takeaways here that we want you to walk away with, if anything. And one of those is uh, emphasizing smaller units of work. As Jacob's example uh, showed us, and as we talked through kind of the theory and the concepts and what has worked for us, um, that's very important to reducing risk and shortening those inspection and adaptation loops, along with those feedback loops too. And then going along the lines of transparency, that transparency pillar that we highlighted at the beginning, take the time to gain a shared understanding of the work and what you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve it. When you take a little bit more time at the beginning to make sure that everybody's talking the same language, everybody understands what the reality of the product is and the experiments you're trying to run, you really set yourself up for success and, and really helps with kind of mitigating the, the conversations at, uh, towards the end and the meetings and everything like that. We, we get things set up up front. Uh, it works a lot better. And then finally, including include automation in your stories. If you wait till uh, this technical debt builds up too much, then it turns into this big, it could turn into these monster projects of trying to automating, automate all of your regression testing. Take it from us, it's much easier to do it along the way as you're building up your product increments to include those in the stories. So with that, I'm taking a look at the Q&A. We don't have any current questions unanswered. Leslie asked earlier if we were going to be sending out the deck. Uh, the answer is yes. We'll be sending out, uh, I believe Taylor will be sending out uh, the recording along with the deck in PDF form. Um, so are there any further questions? Let me hit on this final point, actually. It's really important. So the, all of these, all of these, uh, suggestions around practicing practices around CICD, around different methods that we're using to get the most out of work ultimately is what has been helpful for us. But really what matters is, is what's helpful to your teams. And the only way you can figure that out is through experimentation, the inspection and adaptation to your own processes as well. So I'm happy I caught that last point because that's very important. There are no further questions. Jacob, did we miss anything? Anything else you want to add before uh, we close it out? We're a little early here. Yeah, I uh, I don't think so. I think um, we, we've kind of touched on everything. Again, the important thing here is experimenting and finding out what's wor what works best for your teams. In my team's case, in my example, it was uh, just adding the, those extra details to our stories. Um, your team may find or identify other ways that they can improve their CICD practices or their stories and just buy, uh, take take a shot, make, maybe do an experiment uh, one, and a sprint or two and see what works best for you guys or gals um, and try and uh, just try and uh, make your sprints even better than they have been. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I think one of the key points to your uh, real world scenario and kind of what hits at home is there was no tooling changes in that, right? If you've got an awesome Ferrari, but you don't know how to drive manual, it's pretty useless. And that's really the, the crux of the story is you've got to implement practices. You've got to experiment in different ways of utilizing them to really get the most potential out of them. And, and 
really like turbocharger agile practices. So, absolutely. All right. Well, I still don't see any questions, so we can probably yeah. just wrap it up then. Yeah, for sure. So it, um, on the screen, you should see uh, Jacob and I's contact information. Feel free to email us. Um, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions after this. Um, and if, especially if you're interested in uh, doing, if you're interested in more of this sort of thing from Insight, please contact us as well. So thank you so much. I'll pass it off to Taylor to kind of wrap it up. Thanks. Yeah, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you to the presenters and attendees for your time and opportunity to meet today. Um, just to reiterate, please fill out the survey and the slide and the slides and presenters' contact information will be available in the on-demand link as well, which is this link, and will go live in about an hour after this webinar closes. And we'll turn you back to your day. Thanks.